Last weekend, we held the very first debatable intervarsity. This episode was actually originally released to the participants of that tournament. But we decided to release it on Spotify as well so that those who might have missed out on our tournament do not necessarily have to miss out on the important conversations that we had there. This post-debate analysis was for the fourth round of the tournament, and the theme for that round was economics. We are living in the middle of a recession because of the pandemic. One of the ways that central banks try to stimulate the economy is by setting ultra-low interest rates. Theoretically, these low rates help stimulate the flow of money by encouraging lending and investment, but theory doesn't always match reality. The motion reads, This House regrets the policy of central banks to set ultra-low interest rates when facing severe economic downturns. Thank you so much to Nikki Solis for contributing this motion and for helping us with this interview. We hope you enjoy the episode. Back to another episode of Debatable with your hosts Nina and Kyle. I'm Nina. I'm Kyle. Today we're gonna talk about the economics motion for our very first Debatable InterVarsity. We're super happy to have with us the Nikki Solis. Hi, welcome. Hello, hello. I'm so happy to be on this podcast. I'm Nikki Solis. I'm already in my fourth year inside the university and also my fourth year inside the UP Debate Society. And I'm studying economics currently in UP Diliman. My goal is just to point everyone who's listening towards the interesting world of the macroeconomics of um, interest rates and central banking. It's a really important topic when we're discussing the state that our economy is in and the ways in which our world is changing. Yeah, but don't sell yourself short because like the UP School of Economics is the only <laughs> it's the only center of excellence for in economics in the Philippines. Um, but anyway, since you were talking about how, you know, it's a wonderful world, when you we were promoting um, debatable intervarsity, when it came to the economics motion, we, we said that this was the bad place because you requested us to give a reference to the good place TV show. So you're like, this is the bad place. So what is your advice to those people who may consider econ motions to be the bad place? Mm. So I had interesting and very good advice before on a whole other type of motion, philosophy. And the advice was just to always relate it towards real-world scenarios and always try to ground the debates into the ways that they actually happen in real life. So instead of debating a very highfalutin philosophical debate, you instead analogize it and bring it down towards the ways in which those philosophies and situations really happen in our current lives. And I think the same thing works with economics as well. The thing about economics motions is that they affect us in our real lives in very real ways. People, especially once we're no longer um, inside the undergraduate or high school level and we've gotten on to work, like we care about things like interest rates. We care about things like inflation. We care about things like unemployment. And that's what most people in the real world really do care about. So I think that economics is oversold as a very difficult topic when really economic matters are some of the most pressing issues that most people face nowadays. You need to think about how it affects normal people. And from there, you can begin to build up towards, you know, um, explaining the wider effects of whatever you're trying to discuss. I think secondly also, um, a very helpful trick or a very helpful reframing of your mindset when thinking about economics is to remember that in a sense right the economy is just made of people it's just people who are making decisions and what that means is is that you can think about emotions and feelings and those things matter inside economics anybody who's invested in stocks for example would know the feelings of large groups of people really do have large effects on the economy don't think that economics is a place which has no grounds and a discussion of people and the way that people actually think in other emotions, right? It does. And in fact, those things have very large effects on economies as a whole. Don't throw out your thinking in terms of the way that rational people or irrational people think, right? That's very important to how we think about economics in the real world. The motion might be something that intimidates a lot of people. It's about central banks, it's about interest rates, 
and personally as well i don't know much about it and that's why i'm looking forward to this episode as well so the motion was this house regrets the policy of central banks to set ultra low interest rates when facing severe economic downturns what inspired this motion in particular we're in the middle of a pretty bad pandemic right now and alongside that pandemic is there was a really terrible recession as well almost every country in the world has had uh, successive periods of low or of, of very low growth or reductions in their growth due to the effects of the pandemic and one of the main responses of governments and central banks in economic downturns like this one as well as economic downturns like the financial crises of the dot com bubble and of the 2008 financial crisis is to set very very low interest rates in some cases interest rates which are so low that uh factoring in inflation they're actually negative so uh it, it you're actually losing money if you leave your money in, inside the bank right because the interest rates are not able to keep up with inflation and so the reason why it's very important is because there's now lots of criticism of this strategy of central banks which is happening across the world saying that it's not something which is sustainable it's not something which um, we can keep up with and ultimately it's not something which is going to be effective anymore to, to increase and bring back sustainable growth this is important as a debate because it's the main economic response of central banks right now towards the economic troubles that we currently have could you give us a rundown of what exactly the central bank or the bsp does and why that's important for our purposes today right okay so maybe you guys have seen that meme of uh, jerome powell the head of the u.s central bank or the fed just like cranking out money really fast right in response to the pandemic like printing money really fast and in a sense that's what the central bank is doing and what, what a large part of what central banks do they're in charge of making money literally they're the only entities which can create money inside a given state you know the only the only you can't, you can't print money yourself, obviously. Every single bill that you get has the words Banco Central on it because they're the ones who are in charge of creating and maintaining money. And as you might know, that's an important job because as as um, historically Germany or Venezuela might tell you, if a central bank uh, prints far, far too much money, right, or creates far too much money, bad things can happen. Inflation, too much money will chase too few goods and suddenly everything's far more expensive. Everybody knows about that part, right? Um, the less known part of what central banks do, and is, although it's still related, obviously, is they are heavily involved in regulating and controlling banking and the financial sector. Okay, so in particular, they are the ones who are in charge of managing the investments and the, port the investment portfolio of the state, of the government, right? Um, so you can lend to the state and, uh, and the state borrows from people. That's called, these are called bonds. Right. Uh, and those bonds pay, like any other loans, interest. And that's just one way that the state or the central bank is able to act not only as a printer of money, but as a financial actor on its own. That's number one. It, it, it manages the, 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 the portfolio of the state. It can lend, it can borrow money from people and from international investors, from other states, anywhere. Secondly, um, also, it is a bank. It is literally also a bank, but it is a bank which normal people don't get to deposit or money in or, or borrow money from, but rather other banks do. Okay, so the central bank is a bank for other banks. Um, so your bank, like I don't know, City Bank or Land Bank, uh, can borrow money from the central bank. It can also uh, leave its money there for a moment and then let the central bank um, or rather the central bank can act as a means for it to lend to other banks as well. So I can explain more of that in a bit when talking about how the central bank influences interest rates. But as a summary, OK, um, when you think about what central banks do, they can, number one, you know, print money, like influence how much money there is in the system. Secondly, they can lend and borrow on behalf of the government. And thirdly, they are involved in the banking sector because they're the bank that other banks borrow and lend from and do. All right. So I guess for me, that was very useful because I don't actually know what central banks do. <laughs> but for now, I guess the next question would be in relation to the motion. What are interest rates and are they always clearly defined? Does this mean, for example, that if I lend money to someone, I can't set my own interest rates? Or is that something that's up to the bank and up to the person? Mm. So, uh, you know how economists are, right? Like, we're, we're always lambasted for assuming things or oversimplifying things. And in this case, it's also true. You know, like, we talk about there's, we talk about it as if there's only one interest rate in the whole economy. But as we'll talk about later, that's not precisely true. But in general, right, what we mean when we talk about the interest rate here is that 
the central bank, it targets certain interest rates to be sort of like a baseline or the prevailing interest rate for the whole economy to be operating at. Okay. But what is the interest rate? Um, it's very simple. You know, if you've ever, if you, maybe if you or your, or your parents have gone to the bank or deposited in the bank, right? You, you leave your money in the bank and they give you an interest over time. And essentially what's happening is you've, you've lent your money to the bank and over time they pay you interest on that loan. So really, interest is just the return you can get from lending money to somebody else, okay? So there's two interesting things about what the interest rate does or implies in the economy, okay? Firstly, the, the cost of borrowing money. If, if I was hard up for money, maybe I had gambled all of it away, and I were to ask a loan shark to give me a loan, they might give me enough money, but they would charge me a very high interest rate. It would be very costly for me to borrow that since I would have to pay high interest out to that person a lot over time, okay? So it is the cost of borrowing money. Uh, it, is the, it is the cost of borrowing money. Um, conversely, if interest rates are low, it's really easy for me to borrow, right? If people are offering low interest rates, I can just borrow lots of money and not have to pay a very high interest rate on it. You see credit card companies advertising, oh, 0% interest rate, right? Which is not really 0%, but they're really doing that such that people are going to be incentivized to borrow it because to them, it seems like the cost of borrowing it is low. Okay. So secondly, um, obviously, it's the return, for, just the flip side of that, it's the return from lending money, okay? So if I'm a lender instead of a borrower, and if, if somebody takes my loan with a high interest, I'm happy because that means they're going to be paying me a high return over and over. If you've ever bought bonds from the state, you want high interest rates because that means that you're going to be getting a large amount of return from that loan. Finally, it is also the opportunity cost of holding money, okay? So opportunity cost is a very famous economics term. And it simply says that the cost of something is not just what you pay to get it, but it's what you, all of the things you give up in order to get that thing. You know, the classic example is like, if you pay 300 pesos to go to the movies, but by spending time in the movie house, you're not, I don't know, like playing video games. The cost of going to the movie house is not just 300 pesos, but it's also the cost of that lost time you spent playing video games, right? Similar thing with this. If I am just keeping my money under the mattress instead of lending it to the bank or instead of loaning it out, well, I am kind of losing money because I'm not able to get the interest rate which I could have been earning if I had chosen to lend that money out. So it's the opportunity cost of money. And as you can imagine, if the opportunity cost of money is high, if interest rates are high, people don't want to hold money. They want to lend it out. Not only because the benefit to lending it out is high, but conversely because the cost of holding it is also high. You get me? So uh, those, all, those are all sort of flip sides of what the interest rate means and does. And they become important when you talk about this debate. All of our discussion so far centered on how it affects individual lenders or individual borrowers. How does it affect the economy as a whole? There's always microeconomics. There's also macroeconomics. So far, we've just been talking about the micro aspect. How does interest rates affect the macro aspect? Right. So people need people, not only people, but uh, companies, institutions, they need money to invest, to, to, to buy things, to do anything, okay? You need money, you need, you need a loan to buy a car, to buy a house. Companies or even a small business, you would need a loan to start up your factory, your restaurant, or your business, right? Interest rates, which, which determine just how easy it is to be able to borrow money, are very important for the overall activity of the economy. The standard thinking goes is that when interest rates are low, people are able to borrow more money and therefore they're able to invest inside their businesses, larger corporations, create more factories. From the individual to the, large, to the uh, institutional level, lower interest rates gives you more access to having the ability to invest and create new economic um, development and growth. Now, this is what we call a Keynesian approach, right? The idea that when growth and isn't fast enough or where there aren't enough jobs, we should lower the interest rate such that corporations are going to go out and borrow more money and use that to build more factories and employ more people. Consumers are going to go out simultaneously and borrow more money and use it to buy houses, use it to buy cars, use it to buy educations for their children, and therefore drive up demand in the economy as well. And therefore, from a period of lower growth, lowering interest rates supposedly will increase growth. So it seems that lowering interest rates has a lot of benefits. So I want to ask mm -hmm. about the flip side. In what context would a central bank set the interest rates really high? And are there also benefits to that? 
just as the economy can be running too slowly, there can also be scenarios in which the economy is running too quickly. For example, inflation is really, really high. Prices are rising really, really quickly. Why? Because uh, there's so much demand. People are just borrowing so much money and they are and they're using it to buy so much stuff. <laughs> okay. And in, in that scenario, it might very well be harmful in the long run for the economy to be growing that quickly and to be going that quickly because you might not want it to be you might not want prices to be rising so quickly because that makes things more unstable. It makes it harder for uh, investments to be valuable. All sorts of bad things happen when prices rise very quickly, right? So in that scenario, the central bank might say, okay, you need to put the brakes on a little bit, right? And and reduce the level of growth, reduce the reduce how quickly the engine of the economy is running. Secondly, uh, you might also want to think about stability. Okay, this this goes this also feeds onto later points that you can make. But a large driver in uh, financial crises, you know, like what happened in 2008 in America, which spread across the world, or even in our Asian financial crisis, which hit us here, is that they are often caused by um, loans and investments being made, which aren't really in very good, uh, which aren't actually very good investments, right? Um, for example, inside the dot-com bubble in like the 2000s, you know, um, people were investing money into like speculative new website businesses, which really didn't have any any legs to stand on, but they were simply overhyped. Right. And investors, they had so much capacity to borrow money and they had so much access to money that they just felt like they could just keep on investing in all of these bad companies. And so the moment that a shock hit and that those companies were revealed to be bad, right, suddenly all of those investments turned out to be worthless and things took a turn for the worse from there as um, those failed investments compounded into failed investments for others and a whole financial crisis starts. When an engine runs too hot for too long, it can break down. And a financial crisis is just that. When the economy is running too hot for such a long time and investors are feeling like it can never go down and that they have so much access to money, they tend to make worse investments. And that increases the, that increases the level of systemic risk which happens inside the markets. And sometimes the central bank would feel like, okay, things are going, you know, uh, into a very risky place. They'll say, turn down the brakes, they'll reduce your access to money and therefore reduce the, make it, make it so you have to really think about what you're investing. Yeah. So that, that's, that, that's what, that's how the theory goes now. So you want to reduce inflation and you want to protect from risk. Yeah. How would you contextualize this debate on government side? How would you, for example, define what constitutes an ultra low interest rate and how would you leverage all these pieces of context towards making arguments for gov a very safe definition for what ultra low interest rates are is interest rates which are quite close to zero okay so recently in march the us central bank changed the federal funds rate to near zero, to 0 0.25. Essentially, when interest rates begin to get close to zero, if you account for inflation, they can almost, in some cases, become negative. A really simple explanation of this is that if you've invested 100 pesos in the bank and the interest rate is 2%, but the inflation rate is 3%, you are actually losing money because that money in the bank is reducing in value at a faster rate than the interest rate you are getting when it back is. We are quite close to that happening. Ultra low rates are at zero, near zero, or in some cases, even negative. So um, as for the context, a very, very classic debater context is applicable here, which is that uh, the status quo has failed. <laughs> okay. Um, what's happened kasi is that every single time for the past couple of decades, um, when, whenever some form of economic downturn happens, central banks lower interest rates are very, very much. But the thing is, they don't even reset it to back what it once was after it happens, right? They've tended to stay low and have been going lower over and over again throughout time. What's the problem? The problem is, is that, you know, as I explained, like the theory predicts that we're going to be having increased growth because of lower interest rates, right? But what's actually happening is that, you know, uh, growth figures are not increasing across the world to, to what we would expect them to be, um, given that we've set interest rates so extremely low. And even worse, if you look at wages and incomes of people, they have been even more stagnant, right? So if you remove, you know, like the incomes of billionaires, right, people's wages, which are supposed to, you know, become more exuberant under a better economy, and you know, through um, through increasing employment and through all of the good effects of of lowering interest rate. Well, that's not happening. People's wages haven't been increasing, even though we've, we've kept really, really low interest rates. No, 
And so for government, I would say number one, status quo has failed. And I think the second point of context which we would want to be able to talk about is that we are increasingly less and less able to rely upon this. You know? Precisely because of the fact that interest rates have been held at a quite a low rate for a long time. Every single time we, we drop them closer to zero again and again, it becomes harder for that to be an effective tool because markets essentially adapt towards the expectation that interest rates are always going to be low and they're never going to go back to like a normal you know, higher rate. No? And therefore, not only can you say that they have failed, but even, even the small good that they do is decreasing over and over again since the tool is being overused. Yeah, so I think that's how we could uh, uh, characterize what's happening right now inside this context. No? And obviously, we are currently going through a large economic downturn. One, you know, That's an understatement. It's one of the worst in history. And this is a tool which is currently being used across the world right now. And so you can even say we are at a turning point at which um, states really have to reevaluate what they're doing in order to respond to this really terrible economic crisis and reevaluate if it worked in the past. And you can argue that it didn't. While there is a lot of historical context that comes into this debate, especially for government, how do you prove that the harms are inherent to it and it's not just about mismanagement or people were abusing a system? How do you argue that it's at this point unsolvable now? Yeah, well, what's the logic behind the, the statistic? Okay, so this actually is, is the... It's the interesting part because the, the the thinking goes essentially that the reason why it's not working uh, that you know these ultra low interest rates aren't really helping um, power the economy up, right? It's because as um, you guys kind of mentioned before, there isn't really just one interest rate. Okay, the central bank tries to influence it through several means. But Gov, on Gov, I would argue that in reality, people face very different interest rates depending on who they are, right? So, uh, for example, if I am a, you know, a really big billionaire institutional investor, you know, I can actually um, receive the benefits of very low interest rates and, um, you know, invest huge sums of money inside uh, very good assets, very profitable assets for me, no? But if I am just a working class person, I don't really, I don't often have access to those kinds of assets. I don't often have access towards those, you know, government bonds. I, I oftentimes don't have access towards the same sorts of things which large investors um, put their money in. And what happens is, is that I instead have access towards things like payday loans, things like student loans, things like credit card debt, which doesn't care about what the Fed is doing. It is always high. It preys on the fact that these consumers, they don't have access towards the, the, the prevailing interest rates that the Fed, is wants, the Fed wants to set. And you can make that structural. Why is that happening? Why, are there, why is there prefer- proliferation in very high interest rate, you know, like loans and assets being given out to, the norm- to normal people? You know, making it harder for them to, to pay for their mortgages, making it harder for them to pay for their student loans, even though technically speaking, interest rates should be close to zero. Why is that happening? Well, because remember, the interest rate is... The benefit you get from lending money. That's what I said. That's what you talked about, right? So if you're a bank, are you just going to accept a low interest rate and say, oh, huh, the benefit I get from loaning money, which is supposedly my main my main form of, of profit, is suddenly lower? Huh, I guess I'll just make less profit. <laughs> no, no bank has ever said that, right? What they do is, is that they instead push all of these really high interest rate assets instead. They go into markets that they know um, consumers are going to be unable to access um, those low interest um, investments and market all of these big things towards them. No, so that's one big way, right, in which it has failed because you could say that number one, uh, those low interest rates are not available to many people, and even if even the institutional investors who they are available to, it doesn't necessarily trickle down back to them. You know, oftentimes they'll just make you know more investments or buy back more of their shares instead of actually investing into new corporations. No, but secondly, also it structurally creates the incentives for financial institutions for banks to market um, other forms of predatory lending because suddenly their business model of simply lending to people is not very profitable to them anymore yeah so that's one level of doing it no i think i think another level i think another way in which in which uh, you could talk about it is that it hurts savers okay what that means is is that you know it used to be or it used to be good advice you know to leave your money in the bank or you know to save your money right because that's what is financially prudent to do no but what's happened is because interest rates are so low, you don't get much benefit from putting from saving your money anymore, right? You don't get much benefit from putting your money in the bank. Uh, you get benefit if you're able to access financial markets and big and, and like the so stock market and big invest and, and, and invest in those. But most people can't do that. 
right? And what happens is, therefore, is that you punish normal people who just want to save their money inside the bank by having these very, very low interest rates, which they can't really benefit from, and which might even lose their money if it's not even higher than inflation. No. So that's why, especially in terms of wages, these low interest rates haven't been able to increase outcomes, uh, better outcomes for, I think, finally, also, if the idea is, is that is that interest rates are always going to be low, the market kind of adapts. This is when they talk about feelings and expectations. If you're an investor and you're thinking, huh, when do I want to build my, my factory? Because if the central bank cannot credibly say that, oh, we're going to raise the interest rates after this thing, so you need to invest right now, you're just going to say, oh, okay, interest rates are always going to be low, so I don't need to do anything right now. Okay, I can just keep on going. I can just wait and wait and wait. And don't have, I can just sit on my hands and not really do anything. It's interesting to me because it really does sound like emotions coming into, into play. Like, I don't want to follow the central bank or the BSP right now because... I, I need my money. I want my money. Or people getting preyed on by payday loans with high interest rates because they need that money right now. From what you were saying, it hurts savers because there's no incentive to keep the money in the bank. Does that mean like it, it's possible for savers to start just like pulling their money out of the bank? Um, and it, isn't that like a, a bank run where suddenly the bank doesn't have enough money to keep the financial system going? And like it, it just makes the entire situation worse for everybody just because like the, the interest rate is lower. Is that possible to argue on Gov? That's always a risk in very severe economic downturns. But like the thing is, banks and other financial institutions, they don't really have to fear that because they know that states tend to step in and and, inter- and intervene and try to bait out um, failing banks and failing financial institutions like they did in 2008, right? That, I don't think that's really a big worry for them because the state is something which they feel like they can trust and, and, and fall back on. The interesting thing is, though, is that, yeah, so the question is, right, what do people want to do with their money then? <laughs> if you guys have, like, followed the memes, people are are, are turning towards trying to enter these, these equity markets, these investment markets, and probably investing inside really stupid things, like, I don't know, investing in GameStop or something, because, because they don't trust the fact that the financial advice to save your money in the bank works for them anymore. It's not enough. Their debt is too high. They don't have enough money and the interest rates which they're paying on everything else are on the, on the loans which they get are still high, right? So they just said, okay, I won't trust the bank system anymore. I'm going to try and invest in these assets. And most of them lose most of their money because those are inherently much more risky and they don't have enough money. They don't have enough capital to really take on those risks. Yeah, so that's another harm which happens because of the system. What would you extend for government? Is there a creative angle you can take that's outside of the economic sphere? Is there a philo angle to this? I mean, yeah. not. it doesn't need to be philo. But... Or, or an IR angle to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, number one, this is obviously the kind of debate where having more knowledge about the process of things works will probably work as a pretty good but probably boring extension, right? Um, I think a way in order to... Um, to extend this debate in an interesting way is to bring back the thing we talked about a while ago, which is about systemic risk, right? There's the idea that the market has been running on a low interest rate for decades and decades and so and so long, right? And investors have always felt secure that if there's an economic downturn, interest rates are going to go low, lower anyway, which means that even if my investment messes up, I can still borrow more money and, and you know, it doesn't, I don't have to care, right? And so there's this idea that these ultra low interest rates, which have been going on for such a long time, have been priming us currently and and have primed us for more financial instability, more financial crises, because investors always know, number one, that they will have low interest rates, which will allow them to invest freely, even inside more speculative assets. And secondly, also, they know that if their asset, if, if their speculation turns out to fail, and that causes an economic downturn, right, they will still be saved because the central bank will lower interest rates and will give them still access to more credit. Just keep in mind, right? that the main people who would benefit from lower interest rates, you know, the main investors, the main participants inside financial markets and bond markets, right, are the same people whose irresponsible actions can cause financial crises like 2008. So there's a real sort of moral hazard when they no longer believe that they will face real consequences for making bad decisions. Then you can impact that by saying that, therefore, the cycle of economic downturns of financial crises becomes cyclical, no? Because after every single one, the central bank lowers interest rates, makes it easier for, for investors to make bad investments, and basically sets the conditions for and sets the seeds for the next financial crisis and the next downturn, no? So the dot-com bubble becomes 2008 becomes, you know, COVID, right? And the instability that that, that um, reveals. 
No. So uh, I think it's a real argument to talk about like the long term stability of the whole market, right? And the fact that we're not only having bad results. We, it's not only that like, it's not only that we we're not having growth. But we are creating a far more risky scenario in which it's far more likely that in one fell swoop, millions of people across the world will lose their jobs. Now we can move on to opposition side. How would you try to reframe or recontextualize this on opposition? It, for me, right now, it's it's kind of a challenge. Like especially just listen coming from that discussion, I would find myself in a difficult <laughs> position if I was going to opt. Yeah, but I mean, consider first that like most central banks across the world are all doing this, and these are like the smartest economists in, in like in the, in the world. Obviously, it's not an, an appeal to authority, no, but there is some sense to what's going on, right? The thing is, is that what central banks think they are doing is, is that after an economic downturn, you need to stimulate investment, you need to stimulate lending, no. Um, what happens during an economic downturn is, is that people are very, very scared to lend. Because they feel like um, there's going to be no real reason why number one, I'll get a good return on my investment. But two, if there's a real chance that the guy I'm going to lend my money to, his house has like a mortgage he's been unable to pay for, and so he's not going to be able to pay back my loan, right? So there's a real there's a real worry that people are going to default on their loans inside an economic downturn, inside a financial crisis, and so that becomes a really vicious cycle. No, if some people are scared that others are going to be unable to lend, are going to be unable to pay back their loans, they won't lend. No, and what that means is is that um. The other investors who want to, you know, who might have lent also, they're thinking, "Oh my God, look at look at that look at Bank A over there. They've they've decided that they don't really want to be participating or lending out money right now. No, that probably means I shouldn't do it so either. Because if Bank A isn't 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 um, lending to anybody, then all of the risky people are going to come to me, right? So everybody, it's, it's a chain reaction of people becoming really really scared to invest in the market, and that is 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 unthinkable. No, like the idea that um, overnight. It will become impossible for anybody to get loans to start a new business, loans to send a child to school, loans to buy a new car. You know, like that is um, a scenario which uh, is basically kind of like a hell scenario. And if interest rates are not rescued, if banks essentially charge like super super high interest rates in in a in a very um, in a in, in a very uncertain market just for anybody to get loans for them, right? That's something which is going to hurt everybody. It's going to hurt jobs because it's going to be no new investment. It's going to hurt um, average consumers also because they're going to be unable to access many of the other loans that banks are going to be able to offer them. No, so uh, therefore the first level is I could say is that central yeah is that central banks need to do something. They need to make sure that people are going to be able to access funds. Maybe strategically you could say that our certain forms of loans have different interest rates. That's something which is extrinsic to the idea of having. Ultra low interest rates because in a scenario in which interest rates were allowed to skyrocket really really high because banks didn't want to lend to anybody, then obviously the loans which the normal person would would, would want to buy would would want to get would be even higher, right? Than what than, than what they would be otherwise. So the status quo would be even worse. Basically, is the argument. I think the positive side comes just from the general thinking of how Keynesian economics works, right? Like you would you would say by setting interest rates low after this economic downturn, what happens? What happens is that um, the um, economy has a signal from the central bank that um, it's time now to be able to get back into the market, get back into investing, get back into being able to um, create new job opportunities, create new factories and stuff like that. And uh, consider propping on, on opposition, right? Saying that, yeah, we think that uh, central banks should explore uh, resetting, renormalizing interest rates during normal times. But during extremely difficult crisis moments, the, the central bank needs to be able to um, step in, needs to be able to protect normal people who would otherwise be unable to access um, any sort of financial help now. So I think that's the framework of the basic argument for all. You need to do something, and this is a great tool to do so. And the harms of inaction are so, so, so terrible. The central bank is mostly just signaling. The question I have is, what's the assurance that you know people will follow the central bank or that different banks will follow the signal that's being put forward? Because in our previous discussion, we mentioned that you know, there's a lot of credit card companies, for example, that keep interest rates high. They don't really follow the advice stated. 
even though there are different interest rates on different parts of the economy, the important thing about how the Fed or how the central bank can set interest rates is that it becomes a minimum. Just as an example, one way the Fed can help set interest rates is that for the bonds which it, it, it can issue, which are basically it borrows from the market, you can lend to the government, and it will pay you back a sure interest rate. No? So the interest rate which the Fed sets on its own loans becomes a minimum interest rate for the market, right? Because um, supposedly, you, you can't go below that if you, because if you, if, you are, um, if you are lending at an interest rate below what the Fed is, is, is charging, the Fed, I mean, the, the loans towards the central bank are the most secure loans ever. You're basically 100% sure that they'll never default, no? So all other banks basically, or all other lenders, have to increase their interest rates if the Fed um, increases the the rates on their own bonds. No, but in terms of being protected, being protected from very very high interest rates, um, it's a, number one. It's an, it may me is an ugly rebuttal or ugly answer, but <clears throat> that's something which extraneous regulation can still solve. Uh, you, you can argue on, on government that the capacity for for those types of predatory loans to exist um, can always be mitigated and, cur- and curtailed by actions of people like um, well, even the central bank themselves or other financial regu- or other financial regulatory agencies. No? I think secondly also, um, everyone in the market has to follow what the central bank is signaling, right? Or what the central bank is trying to do. Why? Because even the credit card companies, you know, um, they also have to they also have to care about um, what signals from other lenders are saying, what signals from the central bank are saying. Because if they don't, um, what happens is that um, they, they essentially get um, outcompeted. No, like if, for example, the central bank says it's going to lower interest rates, and one credit company charges an extremely high one, and the other credit company, credit card company, uh, realizes that oh, I can take I can take on a couple more loans from the, the market because of the low interest rates and then use that to offer a slightly more competitive price, a slightly more competitive rate towards my, my buyers, then that still works. No. And in general, what, what I would say again is that the response to government is that it would be worse if the interest rates of the whole market were super high because even those credit card companies would have an even higher interest rate in, in, that, in that scenario than they would in status quo. No. Since you would say the rising tide floats all boats, basically. Since you were talking about extrinsic solutions, I was actually thinking that in the Philippines, we have something called the usury law, which says that if the if a loan gets a certain interest rate, that's an invalid interest rate. Actually, for us, our law says that we can have a maximum or ceiling interest rate that can be imposed by anyone. And if you don't follow that, you could potentially go to jail. The difference is, I think in the Philippines, um, the power to set that ceiling was given to the central bank or the BSP. But the BSP said, never mind, we're not going to impose any ceiling, whatever. I mean, it's just it's a case-to-case basis. So I think potentially you could or you could put in a counter-proposal or something, like a counter-model yeah, on, counter on opposition model. that there are remedies like having usury laws, anti-usury laws, or those kinds of things. Um, but also, considering all those things, um, like the, the principled stance that the government should take, um, that we should protect um, people from high interest rates, how would you argue um, how would you argue the argument about lower interest rates? leading to a better economic recovery especially in the in the context of like those traps that we were mentioning in the previous discussion from government side where it it doesn't really work the way that we expect um that that we expect and even even if like things could comparatively be worse how would you argue in opposition that we were still ending up fixing the problem under up yeah so um I think here now it's 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 important to to think about um the what might have happened or or or, or uh, yeah might, what might have happened if um if those interest rates hadn't been uh, lowered to a large extent now and I think here's where a case which is more of an extension I would argue comes out from opposition right. In economists talk about a, a natural rate of interest now. And what central banks think they do actually when they are, are chasing certain interest rates is that 
the 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 um are really only trying to reflect what the so-called natural interest rate really is okay and put simply the natural interest rate is this um, imaginary idea it's 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 the interest rate if no money was involved or I'll put another way what is the real amount of return on a piece of investment the idea is is inside is that in economic downturns um that that real interest rate or that natural interest rate is obviously low. The return on a new piece of investment inside a really uncertain economic environment would actually be pretty low. <laughs> no, because you know things are more uncertain. Nobody's really going to be willing to um, help you out and invest in your company, right? So it's probably not going to be a very high return on that capital. Why is that important? That's the interest rate, which if none of those other shocks were happening, right? Markets would tend to move towards. And so, if the central bank is trying to increase interest rate uh, artificially above that so-called natural interest rate, then it will have to do um, very, very contractionary policies. It will have to tighten the economy a lot. It will have to slow down growth. It will have to um, put on the brakes. No. So, what I would say as a counter is, is that um, number one, as a, as a policy for expanding growth, this is better than this is better than um, leaving it having a high this is better than having a higher interest rate right because in general all all people are going to be more able to ask credit and we've explained that right but i think the flip side is that um the process for reaching a higher interest rate when naturally the market wants to be at a pretty lower uh, or the, the market might naturally be tending towards a lower interest rate anyway you no know, would be very very deflationary very very contractionary you no know? the central bank would have to pull out would have to pull out so much of the new money it would otherwise create inside the economy it would have to slow down things to an unreasonable <clears throat> to an un, to an unreasonable extent and that's just not something which which you can do inside an economy which is suffering a good example of this is japan um Japan, famously for a while, like in the 90s and, and 2000s, um, you know, uh, facing f- facing uh, certain economic stresses of its own, right? It it had a very very low interest rate, you know, for a long period of time. It had a contractionary policy, and those were known as the lost decades of Japan, because um, they were unable to go out of their slump. They experienced uh, low growth and you know stagnant employment for a very long period of time, right? And that's the kind of thing that can happen if central banks don't tr- don't try to um, reflect what market conditions are, and additionally as well, um, try to inflate interest rates way too high. So. Um, so I guess in this sort of debate, you have to concede that neither policy is perfect, right? And it's just a matter of weighing like harms, weighing benefits, and looking at likelihoods based on trends. So I guess you mentioned already a case of Japan. You also mentioned like the 2008 financial crisis as really strong matter for debaters to use in this round. I wanted to ask if there was more things that debaters could read upon or look into to help them with this particular motion. Besides, like knowing the basic facts or understanding how central banks work, I, I mentioned it earlier in the extension, no? but but in in, in what I uh, suggested su- suggested for the extension. But this motion, kasi, also relates. It's it's really a quite a wide one. This motion also relates to prices. Also relates to inflation. Um, a ripe ground for extension is um, how does the process of heading towards a targeted interest rate affect how the central bank uh, prints or does not print money now. Uh, an example of this is that uh, Gov, might, uh, Gov might argue that in order to lower interest rates, the central bank in 2008, it, it, it did what was called quantitative easing. It essentially um, created a whole bunch of new money by buying in a lot of, a lot of securities, buying back a lot of its own <clears throat> Buying back a lot of its own loans, and therefore injecting lots of money into the economy, um, and you might argue that that increases that that increases inflation by a lot, no, and that's probably bad, right? And you're more and more likely to do that if interest rates are low, since you have no other choice, no. If your interest rates are already near zero, it's really hard for you to lower it further, right? So oftentimes you have to do other things like printing lots and lots of money to 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 deal with the next financial crisis, no. That's what the government say. But conversely, again, on opposition, you might say that rather, if you're trying to increase interest rates, no, from a naturally low low level, um, then what happens is is that um, you get deflation, no, because you have to put on put on the brakes, right? And so actually, there's now a debate, no, uh, what is the natural rate of interest? Is it that 
the economy will naturally tend towards a really high interest rate since people are afraid? Or will, rather, will it naturally tend towards a low interest rate since investments have low returns? No? And that's just the debate. That's just the economic debate, which is currently going on. Nobody is currently sure about that, right? And so it's right, therefore, for people to interpret and to and to really uh, be persuasive and to you know uh, show their shops, basically. That's where the juice of, of the debate in the economic field, I think, currently is. So I think that's it for this like post debate analysis. Mm-hmm. Not only did you get like a basic rundown of you know the important econ aspects for this ocean, you also got a glimpse as to the debates that even economists are undergoing right now. But I guess to end this episode, how you encourage our listeners and the participants in debatable intervarsity to take a greater interest not only in econ debates but also ec- economics in general yeah so um i think firstly if i'm not mistaken you in your podcast you can have like show notes right so i can i can send a bunch of um of the resources i use to research for this podcast there so those who are listening can access them as well um secondly even just listening to your normal like general news sources will oftentimes give you um, enough insights on or interesting events inside and so it, once you learn a couple of economic concepts it pays to think about what exactly is this trying to do? You know, what are the policymakers? What do they think they're doing? What are they actually doing? And are they going to be able to achieve that? No. So, uh, I suppose this applies to many different aspects, but especially for for economic policy as an area which is very uncertain and which there are many possible answers. You you really have to think about. Um, think critically about the intentions of what states are doing and what central banks are doing, what companies are doing, and try to figure out, is that something which is appropriate at this point in time? No. Aside from that, um, you economic, economics is a kind of field where, you, you know, basic stuff like um, supply and demand, um, basic stuff like uh, scarcity and the way that people think also in, in, in large numbers pop up again and again and again. It's why, econo- it's why economists think in terms of laws. Right. So uh, once you learn a couple of um, patterns in the way that you see economic events or, or news, you start to see them everywhere. All right. Thank you so much, Nikki. Personally, I found this very insightful. I'm someone who's really scared of econ motions. This discussion really helped. Is there anything else you would like to promote? PIDC, <laughs> it, right? PIDC is after Vitable Intervarsity. I'm not sure. What, what is PIDC again, Nikki? Um... Oh, I'll be uh, I'll be made fun of for not knowing exactly what, but it is in <laughs> August. Yes, so uh, please please do attend. Please please consider going to the our, our Philippine nationals, right? And around then also we're planning to um still create another tournament for um high school debaters. Um, fast forward. So look forward to that. We'll be planning and, and announcing that soon enough. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you. All right. So we'll leave the maybe links to those events in the description as well as different and we'll share the different pub mats if there are any for those events especially since they also help towards the education of different debaters regardless of their skill level so that's it for this episode of debatable um we'll see you in the next one bye 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 bye